Hello, I'm uh, Peter Carter. I'm director of the Climate Emergency Institute. And I want to uh, uh, talk to you today about um, a, uh, a double emergency, an emergency that has made the climate emergency um, um, uh, terribly, terribly worse. So I'm going to be talking about war as well as the climate. War in Ukraine has been going on for nearly a year now, and um, uh, it's been getting obviously horribly worse and worse and worse. Um, the uh, escalation of this war continues. Um, just a few days ago, we had the annual announcement from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. For decades now, a group of them have been analyzing world situations and um, how close are we to doomsday. And of course, that goes back to the um, uh, nuclear weapons arms race and uh, between the United States and the then USSR. So the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists this year, just recently, they put the hand of their symbolic clock at the closest to midnight that it's ever been. Peace is the most precious thing um, in life. And um, at times like this, we really, really have to hang on to that and, and all work on it. So the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, as they have for the past several years, included the uh, climate change situation in the reason, reason why they put their um, uh, clock closest to midnight. So we, we have a double doomsday here. Um, we're dooming ourselves, we're dooming our future um, uh, with uh, committed climate disruption with continued increasing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, still accelerating atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. Well, that, that's dooming us, that's <laughs> dooming our own children, dooming the future of humanity. But yes, it is much more dramatic uh, in the case of the uh, conflict, which is a proxy war. Everybody's acknowledged it's a proxy war, basically between the United States, yes, and NATO, and uh, the Russian Federation. You know, one suddenly discovers that all the countries in, in, in the world, practically, um, uh, of any economies, they, they, they've all been making these weapons of mass destruction, because they're all weapons of mass destruction nowadays. Um, but we have this situation today in which my environmental friends, just a few years ago, were quite optimistic that uh, we were going to see the end of the days of coal. Obviously, coal energy is the very worst of fossil fuels, produces air pollution, and it produces more CO2 you know, than any of the other fossil fuels. So that seemed to be a, a, a sort of good trend that they considered they were seeing. But um, apparently, according to the International Energy Agency, uh, coal has kicked up in the past couple of years. It's actually at an all-time high now. So coal, produ coal production and combustion is the highest that it's ever been. And the International Energy Agency says that one of the reasons is that natural gas has got so expensive now. That it, and we've also got the European countries that have um, an energy uh, uh, crisis, you know, due to the war between uh, Russia and NATO, um, they're also gone back to coal. So the um, International Energy Agency projects that coal will not decline. It will stay at this all-time high. Till 2025. Um, we have no years left uh, for the climate, We've had no years left for quite a long time. Um, uh, the uh, chair of the IPCC, uh, Dr. Hassan Lee, um, uh, for the past three annual climate conferences, in his presentation, his formal presentation at the opening of the so-called COP, um, he has said that in order to avoid a uh, disastrous global warming of 1.5 degrees C, which now we've missed, and to avoid the catastrophic of 2 degrees C, that global emissions have to, had to decline on an immediate basis. 
Now, you know, people will say, oh, we don't think that's feasible right now. Um, if we don't all work to make that happen, the future isn't feasible, right? So we have to believe in this. It's the science. It's definite. And we all have to get behind it. I mean, the, the chair is doing the best we can, but certainly we should be passing on that message, um, uh, that emergency message. But as I say, we have to win the peace in the world as well. We have to win the peace in Europe. These kind of escalating wars, uh, we've seen them before, right? Um, they only tend to end when there is massive, massive devastation. And of course, that's what we're looking at. Ukraine is being wrecked. It's being ruined. It's being devastated. And uh, it's a beautiful country. Um, great agricultural lands, um, beautiful towns um, uh, that I found in my research at the early stage of the war when the uh, uh, city town of Mariupol was being bombed and destroyed. So um, I don't know. Um, Ukraine is being destroyed. That's what's happening right now. So um, coal energy is now the leading source of energy, the leading source of power. When um, there's a great map, actually, a great fossil fuel map that's uh, one of the good resources recently. And you can look at all the coal plants in all the world and the, uh, how long they've been there and everything. Um, the world's covered in coal plants, <laughs> really, you know. So we can always um, stop fossil fuel emissions. We've known this for decades and decades and decades. We've always known that fossil fuel energy, dirty, killing, deadly, now climate catastrophe, world-ending fossil fuels can be totally replaced with the very best energies that science and technology and, and civilization has ever produced. They really are amazing, um, of uh, clean, renewable energy, 100%. The difference is we have to do it very, very, very fast now. And I believe that we can do that. You know, if humanity, if our civilization got together cooperatively and said, OK, enough of this. We know what the future is with climate disruption and oceans disruption. So we're going to make the switch. Um, we could do it very quickly. But we have to have um, uh, uh, maybe an unprecedented degree of international cooperation um, to be able to achieve this. That means we have to create the peace means we all have to wage peace. Uh, fossil fuels are the fuel of war. Renewable energy have long been recognized as the power for peace. They're very distinct. With fossil fuels, as I've been saying for years, we have no future at all. The science is definite. We have no future with any fossil fuels. Yeah, now we hear about net zero all the time, but the IPCC is very, very definite that net zero means zero fossil fuels. So we have to stop burning fossil fuels completely um, uh, and replace them all. And, um, you know, um, um, U.S. Um, climate ambassador Kerry at uh, Davos said, well, we can do this. All we need is money, money, money. Well, yeah, I mean, in a sense, that's right. Um, but one of the numbers that I had the misfortune to come across is, is that um, uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry over the past few years, they've had this windfall um, uh, um, profit. They've made record profits ever, the fossil fuel industry, in just the past few years. The number that I found was this windfall of $2 trillion. So, you know, we've got governments saying, well, you know, they should spend something. We should tax them and do something about the climate. Um, uh, they shouldn't be making that kind of money at all. And it happens that we need between 2 and $3 trillion put us on a track for some hope of climate safety into the clean renewable energy industry. 
because climate, climate change is not just another environmental problem. It's not just another environmental issue. We used to call climate change in the past the great multiplier um, because we're looking at the entire planet here. Um, uh, we're actually looking at the climate system. So we have climate system change, which is better termed a climate disruption than oceans disruption. And yes, we just, just uh, two weeks ago, we had the annual release of the really, really important, and it, it's great science that these scientists are doing, of the um, ocean heat, of what's happening with the ocean heat. So last year, yet again, the ocean heat was at a record high. And in this report, they acknowledge that it's accelerating. Um, most of our um, heat effect of our greenhouse gas emissions, of course, goes into the ocean, something like 93%. Um, and um, that's bad for the oceans. So as I said, I, uh, one th thing I do is I you know, monitor the um, climate indicators. And um, uh, actually, the climate centers have, have got really pretty good at this, so it makes my job easier. Um, uh, NASA has very good climate indicators. Um, NASA calls it their vital signs. Um, uh, another particularly good one is the uh, EU Commission, equivalent of NASA, which is Copernicus, and they publish on a regular basis climate indicators, as does NOAA in the United States, the um, National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. So I uh, came across, um, because I checked these, um, just about 10 days ago, I came across a post that said that um, atmospheric CO2 had increased to 420 parts per million. Hopefully, we all know that the uh, uh, safety limit is 350 parts per million. So we're way, way, way above that. Um, this is accelerating. Uh, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, which of course is the source of most of the heating, at least two-thirds of the heating, but it's also the source of uh, all of the ocean acidification, which is a planetary catastrophe in its own right. The, um, uh, um, the increase in atmospheric CO2 is completely unprecedented. The World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, um, did a special on this in their annual greenhouse gas bulletin. They said that the rate of increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was completely unprecedented. We could go back as far as we could with our you know, proxy records, which go back 40 million years. And the CO2 rate that we are pouring into the atmosphere is higher than anything that we can find back um, 40 million years. It's, um, uh, it's happening at at least a hundred times faster than the natural warming event at the end of an ice age. The atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, which of course is the source of most of the heating, at least two-thirds of the heating, but it's also the source of uh, all of the ocean acidification, which is a planetary catastrophe in its own right. So this is completely insane. War is totally insane, and this is completely insane. As, um, you can't rationalize that kind of finding, which is completely definite because they're direct measurements. It's, um, it's crazy, crazy. Now, the scientists and uh, most of the environmentalists now are very, very well aware <coughs> of the um, of the methane monster. So methane is the second most important greenhouse gas to CO2. It's another carbon gas, CH4. And just a few years ago, methane literally rocketed up at an explosive rate. Um, uh, methane was fairly steady um, for many years from year 2000. And then all of a sudden, around 2006, it started increasing again. And methane has been increasing at an accelerating rent rate since then. 
But in the past few years, it's gone up explosively. There's a lot of natural sources of methane, um, but we have a large number of human sources. All of those human sources are increasing. The emissions from all of the human sources are being increased. A very big one is natural gas. Natural gas is mainly methane. Um, so when you burn natural gas, you still produce carbon dioxide, so you still boost this unprecedented increase in carbon dioxide, even though, yes, it's a lot less than coal. But, of course, the scientists recently have found that methane leaks from the God knows how many, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of millions of miles of pipeline, um, particularly in Europe. I mean, Europe is just a network of natural gas pipelines because um, all of these have been mapped. So inevitably, methane leaks out of the pipeline, the distribution places. Um, uh, there's published science on this. And that is increasing with the increase in uh, natural gas. And um, now um, the science is that actually natural gas is almost as bad as coal with regards to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, climate disruption effect. The biggest natural source of methane emissions is from wetlands. And um, around the world, you know, wetlands are vast. So wetlands, we're looking at a lot of methane emissions. And the scientists say they've been very worried for a few years about methane, but they're more than worried now because they've determined um, that one of the contributory uh, sources of the methane explosion is feedback, uh, feedback emissions from wetlands. So because the temperature in the surface of the planet is being pushed higher and higher and higher by our continual emissions, constant, constant, continual emissions of um, greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, um, these wetlands are now emitting more methane than they have been doing. So. Um, uh, this is the worst case nightmare scenario of all environmentalists interested in climate for many, many decades. So I want to go in now to the costs of war. The RAND Corporation in the United States recently published an opinion on the war in Ukraine. They said this is one of the bloodiest wars in modern history. One of the very bloodiest. They said, the RAND Corporation said, that the loss of life, the killing, is extraordinarily high. And the RAND Corporation said that on both sides, now, every day, hundreds of uh, soldiers are being lost, killed, incapacitated, in the hundreds. Those are young men who are being killed. Every one of those young men is a family. So the latest estimate is up to 180,000 Russian casualties. This war has only been going on for just almost a year. And the experts um, are saying 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Evidence to buy the trench warfare. World War I trench warfare. Um, the amount of ordnance um, bullets, shells of all sizes, is absolutely unbelievable. It's good that people are more aware of the civilian deaths in Ukraine. As I say, the country of Ukraine, the beautiful country of Ukraine, is being demolished. The civilian deaths are, are horrible. We're, we, you can see them every day on the news. So they amount to um, 30,000. I've actually seen 40,000 civilians that have been uh, killed due to the bombing. We were aware and we are still aware, thanks to the uh, United Nations uh, refugee program, of the millions and millions of Ukrainians um, uh, who were displaced, were literally forced to flee from that. <coughs> uh, th this is hard to talk about and I know it's hard to listen to. So, um, you know, images of... A mother with a child and she carry a sort of handbag or 
all her belongings, fleeing their own country. So that's about seven million refugees now. Those are millions of families at present um, torn asunder, you know, children and wives not seeing their fathers. And the numbers are over six million people internally displaced, of course. You can see the apartments that have been destroyed. You can see the villages destroyed. You know, those humble houses blown apart. Right? That's millions of people too. So, in Ukraine, we're looking at a year of total devastation to their infrastructure, to their buildings, to their beautiful buildings, devastation. But to the population of Ukraine, to the families, that's devastation. This is what war is. This is what modern war is all about. So the numbers are damage to housing in the Ukraine estimated at 54 billion, 150,000 residential properties severely damaged or destroyed, 130,000 private houses, 17,000 big apartment buildings, And um, I remember reading that um, the, um, I think the UN um, Department of Human Rights was uh, keeping a record on, um, uh, um, because this is a war crime, a uh, record on hospitals and emergency and healthcare centers um, uh, that have been um, uh, destroyed, damaged by rockets, right? This is indiscriminate, ruthless warfare, and it's actually aimed at civilian targets in the Ukraine. There's no question about that. They're waiting for the Ukraine to capitulate. Well, we need to have peace, not a capitulation. We need to have peace. Um, oh, so the damages to hospitals, healthcare clinics, over 1,000 medical facilities ruined. And we're talking about hospitals destroyed. We saw this in Mariupol. Patients in the hospitals losing their lives. They were in that hospital that was rocketed and destroyed. Um, economic, uh, the cost of Russia. The cost of Russia is claimed to have been huge with regards um, to their soldiers um, um, killed um, or, or incapacitated, and um, the research um, holds that up. But I want to finish off um, with the biggest uh, cost of all um, of this particular obscenely evil war, as all modern wars are. And um, that is the cost of the climate and the oceans and, uh, and the forests, all the forests in the world, and the costs to our future. So this proxy war, this world war, as I've said, is actually a world-ending war. And it's not only because of the increasing risk of uh, nuclear weapons being used and a nuclear conflagration, which is a real, real risk, and it's really increasing. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, Mr. Putin has um, made veiled threats on the use of nuclear weapons, but they've got them. Actually, Russia still has more nuclear weapons than the United States. There's a lot of them, a lot. Enough to end what we call our world. So, uh, this war, because it is boosting emissions so directly of carbon dioxide and methane. Um, this war is a war that's destroying our future. The cost of this war 
is the cost of our complete future, not just civilization, but our future at all. Because um, we already have, and I've mentioned, uh, we've already been idiotic enough to trigger methane feedback emissions. So I, I, I sort of wrote a little conclusion, which, which, I, which I think I've said, but it bears repeating. Escalation of this war means we are all losing. There are no victors in these modern wars, only victims. We're all losing. Let's be very clear about that. But with uh, climate disruption and the level and the increase of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, we're losing everything, everything. We're losing our entire future. We're losing Earth. And it's not one little come and go. Uh, the effects of climate disruption are permanent. Whatever you hear, they're irreversible. So um, I guess the final message I should make is, is the message from uh, uh, Dr. Hassan Lee, the chair of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it's in working group three. I did some more work on that yesterday. Global emissions have to decline on an immediate basis. And that's a survival imperative. So the war has to be stopped. Peace has to be made, peace has to be realized. Um, yeah, it doesn't look likely, and some people would say it's unfeasible, but um, what, we're human beings, whatever we, whatever we imagine, and then we imagine in a group, we can make it happen. We can make it happen. Peace is always possible. We've known for decades it's always possible to what the IPC says, reverse greenhouse gas emissions. It's always possible, readily and easily possible, in the absence of war, to put greenhouse gas emissions into decline. Any year, our leaders and corporations within any year can do that. It's pretty easy. Obvious. Um, uh, United Nations Secretary General has stressed it over and over. Charge the fossil fuel corporations with the cost of their air pollution, which kills 10 million people every year. If that's not evil, I don't know what is, and it is. Um, uh, and we have to charge them the full cost of their deadly killing pollution. Um, we should, be, uh, we should be ruthless with these corporations. We had another um, paper published of uh, expose of how long Exxon knew about the effects of continuing to burn fossil fuels and continuing to burn the atmosphere. And it goes back to the, to the early 80s. Yeah, Exxon and all these corporations, they may have been OK one day, but they're evil today. They really, really, really are. And uh, so we have to get out and we have to exert as much pressure as we possibly can on our governments to stop the subsidies and the fossil fuel corporations to do what British Petroleum did years ago but then abandoned, um, and that is to become energy corporations. The natural thing for fossil fuel corporations to do is to switch to become energy corporations. Build and sell wind turbines. One of, one of my favorite is deep geothermal energy. Um, Exxon and those, those companies, they're, they're experts in drilling, in drilling anywhere and drilling deep, right? Um, we can power the whole world many times over with geothermal energy alone. Uh, we, the people, um, we, the parents and the grandparents particularly, uh, we have to be very forceful. And our governments, banking corporations, of course, that finance the um, uh, planet-destroying, planet-killing fossil fuel projects. Um, uh, um, and we have to be, um, we have to make them stop. 
It's a um, climate change is a stop situation. It's not a reduce or, or improve. It's a stop, right? And convert to a much, much better and healthier life. And the potential of the world being run only on renewable energy is the brightest future that humanity could ever think of. It's not expensive. The price goes down the more you use. Um, uh, it's localized, so you don't, we're not going to see wars being waged over um, solar energy, for example, right? Or geothermal energy. Uh, that, that, that's an inherent um, uh, uh, terrible problem with the fossil fuels, of course. They're localized in particular places, so governments make weapons and nuclear weapons in order to protect those interests. Um, but today we only have one interest. Our interest is establishing peace, and our interest is converting uh, from a fossil fuel polluting economy to a renewable clean energy, clean energy economy. So uh, thank you very much for listening.